Wonderful to be able to come around the Word of God together again this evening and uh, following the Moravian Daily Texts. Uh, we're in Galatians chapter 4. Um, tonight this is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia um, who were being captivated, bewitched we might say, by a, a false kind of a gospel that said, yeah, Jesus is great and all, but you need to add to Jesus all of these other religious practices. In fact, what was being done was that the, the people who were coming into freedom in Christ were then being enslaved once again by a law which had already been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And Paul is just so earnestly, lovingly, desperately longing um, for the, the people to remain in their freedom um, and not to um, slide backward into the things that are of death. Now, um, again, in the reading that we have today, Paul is going to make contrast. Um, but what really, uh, really impressed me, I guess, um, as I've been reading this passage is um, what Paul then describes in verse 24, when he's telling the story again of um, Abraham and uh, his two sons. Uh, one was the son of the promise of God who came to him by his wife, Sarah, um, that son being Isaac, and the other son was uh, the, the son that came about largely due to their fear, their um, impatience, um, their scheming. And Abraham lay with his wife's maidservant, Hagar, and the son Ishmael came from that. And whilst it certainly is a very human story with many human implications, here um, Paul uh, does something really, really profound that it's quite startling to me at least Verse 24, he says, now this may be interpreted allegorically. And, and what he's going to describe here, well, it can only be granted to him by means of the Holy Spirit giving him inspiration about the text, about the word of God, the histories that Paul would have had access to, um, which was his own history as a, a member of the Jewish people. Um, in this context, what does he say? Well, he says these two women are two covenants. Sarah is one covenant, Hagar the other. Hagar, one, is from Mount Sinai. Now, if you've been following these passages, you'll know that that's um, a synonym for the law. Um, Hagar, Mount Sinai, the law. Bearing children for slavery, she is Hagar. Uh, Mount Sinai in Arabia. Um, slavery with her children. Um, and, and Paul says that's the, the present Jerusalem, the place that put um, Jesus to death, um, is also enslaved to um, Mount Sinai, the law, that old covenant. But then he says the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. Um, contrasting that with, with Sarah who bore the son of the promise um, from whom then the fulfillment of the promise ultimately Jesus Christ has come this is just stunning um, because whilst we you know when we read it it makes perfect sense but um, how many of you had that insight um, prior to uh, reading what Paul has been inspired by the spirit to write in Galatians how many of us perhaps would have drawn that inference and and, and woven that narrative through all of redemptive history in the Bible up until this point and even to our own lives. This is incredible. And, and just as Paul is saying that the, 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 the one covenant, the old covenant, Mount Sinai, the law is represented in Hagar is enslaving and, and the other is life. It, it struck me that this is this is really pertinent to how we even read the Bible. You know, how does it come to you? How does it strike you? You know, do these pages seem dry and dusty? Do they seem like so many laws and rules and regulations to, to trammel and fetter your human experience and to uh, crush your spirit? Well, if so, uh, likelihood is you've been reading them as, as, as legalistic um, documents of an old covenant, which in truth has, has passed away or at least been fulfilled. It ought not to be so. We ought to come to these pages recognising that herein is life. And life in all its fullness. It's not old. It's not dead. It's not legalistic. Here is the grace of God as demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. 
And yes, we come to it from a position of desperate need because of our inability to meet the standards of the old covenant. But we're here and we come to this new covenant, which is through Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his glory. And it's brought to us as life. And the pages are full of life. To Paul, he, he, he must have, uh, you know, through the lens of Jesus Christ, come again to these stories. Can you imagine as the pennies dropped for him, as the spirit just moved him? And he was like, oh, I've never seen this before. How have I not? And, and here he is then uh, giving this to the churches in Galatia to, to move them also from the ways of death to the ways of life. This is absolutely stunning. I, I really do believe that it is. And, and, and how should then be our response to these things? Well, it's there in verse 27. Rejoice, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labour. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Look, you come to the Bible dry, weary, you know, lost in your own inadequacies, in your own inabilities. You feel the, the, the weight of, uh, of, of your own faults and failings, of your own sin, let's be honest. We come to the text like this, we come to the Bible like this, and yet there in these pages, the Spirit would introduce us to Jesus so that we might rejoice, so that even in the barrenness of our own doing, of our own living, yet through jesus you know the spirit might almost like conceive something within us and you know here i am uh, saying this as a man so you know the, the spirit must be doing something good uh something is conceived and birthed within us it's new life this is stunning and you know paul he's bringing these insights the new life for the old legalism as he interprets the text of the scriptures and he applies it to moving from the law into the uh, the grace of Jesus. Then he brings it into the context of the churches in Galatia. And he says, look, you know, the people who are loading the old legalistic ways upon you, verse 17, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. That they're invested in you, uh, but it's not for your good. They're seeking to actually drag you back into, into the deathliness of things that have been completed. They're seeking to drag you back into places and, and ways of barrenness that cannot bear fruit within your life. And in fact, Paul says, they want to shut you out that you may make much of them. There you would be, loaded and burdened with your own sin as evidenced by the law. No matter what you did, it wouldn't be good enough. I'm reminded of, of Martin Luther, the great reformer, and uh, living within those those days of of the indulgences of the, the medieval Catholic Church and, and trying with all his might to meet some imagined or frankly heretical standard of God that was given to him by the church of his day. And he knew he couldn't. And yet when he opens up texts like this, Galatians, Romans, life sprung forth as he realized that there was the free gift of, of new life in Jesus. Look, if anybody seeks to beat you down with more and more and more that you must do in order to earn standing before God, then please be assured it is not what you do that earns you your standing before God, except that you place your faith in him, surrendering your life to him, to understand that he determines who you can be before him. There's nothing else that will give you the foundation in life. And so, look, we just want to conclude um, Paul, again, in verse 19, as he often does, he refers to them as my little children. He's not burdening them as hard taskmaster. He's not asking that they make much of him. Look, any good father knows that your children will embarrass you more than they'll do anything else. Uh, that The demands are massive, and yet your love flows for them nonetheless. Here is Paul with this church in Galatia, and that's his heart. Look, he says, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. Hmm. What's the contrast? Well, let me read to you as we close some verses from Paul to the church in Thessalonica. First Thessalonians 1. I'm way jumping ahead. The Moravian text will get us there in a long time from now. But just this is what it looks like when Paul, this dad, makes much of his little children for good purpose. Life, fruitfulness, not death and barrenness. 
grace and peace with God, righteousness through Jesus, not legalism and, and the doing that is so dry and dreary. No, come on, let me read this to you. Paul says this over, over his dearly beloved children in, uh, in Thessalonia. It's what he wants to say over the church in Galatia. It's what God wants to say over you. So come on, maybe just sit back, relax. This is how it ought to be. We give thanks. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labour of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake and you became imitators of us and of the Lord for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Turning from idols, all dead ways, to Jesus, to Jesus, who delivers us, because he is so good. Look, come on, just present your life before God. Would you do that? Are you dry? Are you weary? Does your life feel barren? Look, maybe you don't know what it is to have life in Jesus. Does everything you do seem to turn to dust? <laughs> Jesus would welcome you to flourish in him. And all it will cost you is putting your whole and total life in his hands. Giving up being Lord of your life and acknowledging that he is the one true God. He's your hope. He's your hope. And he'll remain your hope. Don't trust in anything else. Come on, should we pray, Jesus? Oh, we thank you. We thank you that you, I mean, you find every single one of us and we're dry and we're weary and we're barren and we're broken. And God, you bring life. Jesus, we would not for anything turn back to things that were of death. You know, we, we've been reading recently, God, of how in its proper time, the law was like a, how do we say, a jailer. And it kind of kept us from our own worst impulses. But if we go back to the law now, then the law is no longer a jailer for us, keeping us away from our worst. No, you've broken us out of jail. If we go back to it now, the law is a slaver, enslaving us to those ways which should not be for today. Lord Jesus, we thank you. You found us in the jail that was stopping us from, well, worse. But you've broken us out. We would not return to slavery today. Thank you for setting us free. Let us live in your freedom. Be fruitful in your freedom. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And look, if everything that I've said tonight is so confusing to you and... Uh, just doesn't seem to make much sense then send us a message let me confuse you some more no no really we would love to help you and just walk you through some of the basics of what it is to know new life in jesus it's open to you it's open to you god bless you good night